You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay, actually. I'm just very involved with the Women's Prize long list. I don't know why I've decided that I really want to read every single book on the long list, of which there are 16. But I'm going to have a crack at it and I'm loving it so far. I can't believe I am enjoying it. I didn't think they'd be for me, but never mind. Anyway, so this episode is about one particular book and it's also about the Women's Prize long list. How many books have I read so far? I'm just checking in with you because I've read four so far and I've got views. I've got things to say. So whether you're interested in the long list or not, I think it might be worth hearing what I've got to say just because there are some books that stand out and some that don't, as, as you might expect. But let's get stuck straight into the book. And the author I'm going to be speaking to today is Alina Kwaja, whose book is called Maya's Laws of Love. And the other books I'm going to mention are Western Lane by Chetna Maru, Restless Dolly Maunder by Kate Grenville, River East, River West by Aubrey Lescure, and The Blue Beautiful World by Karen Lord. We better get stuck in because we've got a lot to cover today. The first book, Maya's Laws of Love by Alina Kwaja. Now, this book is about, obviously, Maya, Maya Mirza, who's so convinced she's unlucky in love and life that she's come up with a list of laws to explain it. Most importantly, law number one, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Law number six, trips are never smooth sailing. And law number four, when you think you're lucky, think again. Um, but as, as it says, maybe rules are meant to be broken and detours can be embraced. So enough about me. Let's talk to Alina now. It is my huge pleasure to welcome to the podcast today, Alina Kwaja, whose wonderful book is called Maya's Laws of Love. Alina, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Very, very excited to talk to you about this beautiful book that made me smile. But for those who haven't read it and haven't heard about it, can you give us a little bit of a summary of the book? Sure. So Maya's Laws of Love is about a young woman named Maya who has always believed she's been unlucky in love, who may have finally met the man of her dreams on the way to her own wedding. (laughs) Yes. And it goes on from there. I mean, as I say, it's a lovely book to read. Gave me a really warm glow as I was reading it. Was it lovely to write? Did you enjoy writing it? Oh, so much. Like I actually had a Twitter thread where I was updating my progress each day because I think I wrote the whole first draft in 31 days. And sometimes I go back to look at that thread and I can just see all my updates. Like my word counts are always so huge. Like 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 words a day. And that's how I know I was having so much fun. Like I could not, could just not stop writing. So have you written before? Yes, this was my seventh written novel. Wow. Okay. So you, yes. Mm -hmm. So you know when something is speeding ahead and sort of captivating you as you're writing it. Yeah. And was it easier to write than those other books because, because of that? I will say maybe actually, yeah, because I have had passion for my projects in the past, but like this one was so different. And also because, because it was actually my very first attempt at doing adult romance. Before this, I had been strictly YA. So I was really excited, you know, new age category, somewhat new genre, because this is just pure romance. Whereas in other books I've written, the romance was a subplot. And I'm a very meticulous plotter. So like I had everything laid out from beginning to end. So that really helped speed up the drafting process as well. That paired with my excitement. And do you find with your background writing sort of YA and those sort of books that your approach is to only keep what matters and to keep people's attention? You know, this book just gripped me and there wasn't there weren't wasted words in it. And I wondered if that came from the YA writing. Actually, maybe not personally for me, because when it comes to my YA, sometimes I can meander a lot, just like having these teenagers be doing whatever. (laughs) But this book was so different. I think it also depends on what outline you use. I'm also very big 
fan of outlines. So I use two different ones. So usually when I use YA, I use the three act structure just because it kind of pieces really well. But for this, I found a different one to use online and it could work with like percentages instead. So at 5% of the novel, this should happen. At 20%, this should happen. At 40%, this should happen. So that kind of really also helped with figuring out what plot beats needed to go at what percentage just to keep things going and keep things flowing. And how did you get the idea originally for this story? Oh, this it's so complicated because it come it comes from like so many different places. So one was I watched a Taiwanese drama years ago that kind of uses Murphy's Law similarly. And I was like, wow, that'd be really that's a really cool idea. I wonder how I'd be able to adapt that. But just put that in the back of my head. And then I wanted to write a road trip novel because I love road trip novels. One of my favorite Bollywood movies is a road trip novel. I love the movie Leap Year. And I wanted to do that. And also I, so this is, this is funny. So in my third year of university, it was right before the pandemic actually happened. And I was thinking about what I possibly wanted to do after I finished university. And I casually brought up to my mom, I was like, I might want to go and teach English abroad, like maybe in Dubai, maybe in Korea, just like the, that stuff's kind of it's fun and it really excited me. And my mom immediately said, you can go, but you have to be married. And I was in, instantly I was like, why would I do that? Like the whole point of being young and doing that kind of stuff is that you're just having an adventure. Like you don't want to have a spouse waiting for you at home when you're trying to have fun and doing those kind of things. It's just not really the idea I had in mind. And then I immediately thought after that, what if there was somebody who had to do that? And then I just changed it from married to engaged. And then I just put all of those ideas together and my as well as love was one. And it's fair to say that on this Maya, we don't want to give any spoilers away, but Maya um, comes across some complications to her travel plans, I think it's fair to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you build those in? Did you know straight away that that was going to happen? No, I think it all just happened naturally as I was outlining. Because for me, when I outline, I see the book very much as a movie in my head. So it'll go, I'll have, I'll outline the scene structure. I'll outline, I'll even have dialogue in there. Like in my head, it's like reading it back and forth. Like he said this, she said this. So literally I'll have that in my outline. He, she, he, she, he, she. And it all just, I, I just thought about what is the worst thing that you could do or that you could have happen to you while you're traveling? And then how can you make it worse? <laughs> yes. Tell us a bit more about Maya then. What's she really like? Oh, she is just a disaster figuring <laughs> out how to live like so many of us are when we are in our, even now, late 20s, mm. because it's so, it's so funny. I'm only 25. I just recently 25 turned 25 in January. And when I wrote the book, I was still just 23. So I'm still not the age that Maya is when she is in this book. She is just, I was just trying to piece together whatever I was feeling. She's just trying her best and really is, I think she's a really positive person, despite having a lot of, you know, bad things happen to her, not to give away too many things. But she, I really like love that optimism about her, even though, okay, this is going bad, but how can I make it right? Or how can I figure out how to make a good thing of this bad situation? And I think that's just the kind of person that she is. Trust me, I'm 52 and I don't have my life sorted out yet and I don't <laughs> know where I'm going. So yes, I don't think anybody, if anybody says they, they do, I think they've got more to worry about, to, to be honest. So what was the most challenging part of writing this book? The most challenging part? Hmm. I think I would say like just figuring out the pacing because originally the start of the book was a lot shorter like in my outline they started this is minor spoilers but they were in Pakistan right away this stuff in Switzerland did not exist and it was as I was writing that I realized no they need they need more time together before they get there because I also couldn't figure out what else to do while they're in Pakistan aside from what I had already outlined so I was like, okay, let's go back to the drawing board and figure out what they can do instead. And I was thinking, I had gone to Pakistan, I think maybe even that year, earlier that year, or in 2020, I think. And I noticed because they have those screens on the seat in front of you, like that documents where you're going or where at what point you're at in your travel. And I noticed that on the flight to Pakistan, you fly over Switzerland. And I have a good friend who lives there, Zulfakatua. And I was like, wow, like I could, I'm flying over Zulfa right now. And then I thought back to that and I was like, 
okay, if you fly over Switzerland to get to Pakistan, conceivably you could make an emergency stop there. So I was like, okay, emergency stop in Switzerland. And immediately after I picked Switzerland, I was like, I have to put crash landing on you in there, which is this K-drama that I absolutely love. It's my favorite. It's a really big part of the book. And then I was like, okay, perfect. Like you, I can set up things where they go to different filming locations and, you know, they can bond on their travel like that too. And that's how I lengthened act one. And I think that would probably be the most challenging part is just making sure everything paced well. Because even then after I signed with my editor, we had to cut certain scenes because my editor felt like they were repetitive. And I'm like, yeah, I guess it makes me, made me sad because there's one that I really, really love. And I was like, okay, I get it. So I had to cut it, but it was still, it was still nice. And you're going to read us a little bit from the beginning of the book. Yes, yes. All right. Can I say? Please. Maya's law number one, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Dr. Khan, you know how Desi families are when it comes to weddings. I lift my head from the back of the love seat I'm lounging on. Everything is an emergency. I feel like I spent all my breaks during the school year planning for this wedding. Once this whole fanfare is over, I'll be able to focus on me for a change. My therapist's office is very zen, which I suppose all therapist's office should be. Three pale blue walls, with the last wall behind her desk being white. The desk, which she rarely sits behind during sessions, is long and gray. There's some clutter, stray pens, a file stuffed with papers, a coffee cup that's half empty and looks like it's been sitting there for a while. Hanging on the white wall are three white canvases with gorgeous Arabic calligraphy and shades of cerulean and gold. The only thing that seems out of place is the bright orange love seat. It's such a strange color for an office scheme, but according to my therapist, Dr. Zara Khan, it was a gift from her uncle who leases the place, so she couldn't refuse it. I hated the color when I first started coming here, but it's grown on me so much I would defend it to anyone. You know how much I love it when you take me time, Dr. Khan says. She pushes her dark brown hair over her shoulder, and the fading sunlight streaming in through the window gives it a golden glow. You need to be more aggressive about it. Dr. Khan, I'm the daughter of a Pakistani. I say, disbelief underlining my words. I was raised to be a people pleaser. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. I mean, it's it's a memorable book and not all books are. I thought it was just lovely. But can I get a Maya t-shirt? Are there Maya t-shirts to be had? Oh my gosh, I wish. Can you imagine? (laughs) Yeah. I've been wonderful because we were just talking before we started recording about the different book covers as well because I've got the UK version and you've got the the US one there and they are very different which if you had to choose a favorite which one would your favorite be Oh my god that's like asking me to choose between <laughs> children I know so I um, prefer the US one actually it's the characters yeah. are more prominent on it I think I prefer the US one too, but it's also biased because I saw the US one first and I was really, really involved with the the creation of it. I think for the US cover, I definitely saw it in a lot of like stages, like from initial idea to initial sketch to colors and then finally to the final product. Whereas with the UK one, they just sent it to me when it was done. And I was like, okay. Or I think I saw two stages. I saw one with which was like pretty much all done and then the actual final version. But I love them both still, but I think I have a preface for the US. And you live in Canada, or certainly you're in Canada at the moment. We're recording this. Does Canada yep. have exactly the same cover as the US? Presumably they use the same one. Yes, it comes out next week, the 26th. And how are you feeling about publication day? I'm, I feel like I'm getting really nervous as it's coming up, but I'm also getting really excited, but also I don't care. <laughs> I'm trying to like keep, and this is like I don't care. I'm trying to keep like a level head because I'm like, okay, I really, really hope it just does well. But just in case it doesn't, it's okay. It's whatever. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter. But <laughs> are you a fan of publication days normally? Yes, because, <sighs> oh, when it's publication day, like for my friends or like other books that I'm super excited about, it's like that publication day could not come faster. and in england this book is published on the 28th of march and this episode goes out on the 1st of april so it will already be available you've already just published in the uk by the time this interview goes out we will yes soon be hearing about everyone reading it and and enjoying it i wondered though with writing and however and how many books you've already written 
Obviously, you're a proficient author, but what drives you to write? I think it's probably a way of expressing myself, but also growing up, I was never really good at anything else. I always really wanted to be that person who was really good at math, really good at science, really good at like visual art, but I just never was, no matter how hard I tried. And I did try a lot. But with writing, it just, it felt so natural to me, like so easy. And it was just such a fun thing for me to do. I just had so much fun with it. And it was just a way for me to express myself and just also engage with other people because I started my writing career when I was 13 because I wrote fan fiction. And yeah. it was, yeah. And when you upload stuff onto like fanfiction.net, you have that interaction with reviewers who respond immediately after you post something. And it really brought me a sense of community in that sense as well. That must be quite a tough audience, though. I presume they're quite direct about what they think. Uh, yeah, it definitely helped me develop a thick skin. And that's why I think I'm, I'm more poised to handle publication now. <laughs> but I was very lucky too, though. I had a lot of really good, I had a lot of really good people reading my stuff. They were just people who loved it. So it was, it was very nice. And so what was the fan fiction? What were you writing about? Okay, my fan fictions of primary choice were The Vampire Diaries. The spinoff yeah. for the Vampire Diaries, the originals. I wrote for BBC's Merlin. I love BBC's Merlin. And there was one more, Twilight. So regular teenage girl's repertoire in the yeah. to mid to the 2010s. Yes. Yeah, so Maya's Laws of Love is quite different from those sort of three areas. It's uh, quite a gear change for you. Oh, yeah. Pretty different. That's why I was really, I was, I'm really shocked that my debut is actually an adult romance because like I said, all I wrote before was YA. And for the most part, those YA had some sort of fantastical element to them. So then when I wrote Maya and then it ended up being the one that was published first, I was like, I don't think I could have ever seen this coming. Are you writing a similar type of book next or are you reverting more, not to fan fiction, but that sort of, as you say, fantastical element in your next book? I do have a project that is on submission right now that is YA urban fantasy. So I'm hoping something good comes of that. But as of what I'm writing next, I am working on revising a YA rom- rom-com. And because I think I finally settled, I'm okay with the fact that I write rom-com or I'm more confident in the fact that I can do it. Because like I said before, my romance used to be really subplot because I didn't think I could do it. And then I have been working on my next adult romance book. So I can talk a little bit about that. All I can say is called Stranger Than Fiction. It's also out for Meyer Books next year. And it follows a young woman who is just about to give up on her dream of being published when she's visited by the physical manifestation of her writing muse who must convince her to keep going. (laughs) That sounds great. And I would have to say, to be honest, normally I'm not a huge fan of reading rom-com fiction. That's not my thing normally. But this book wasn't a traditional rom-com. The characters were really there and I didn't feel frustrated with the sort of the some of the life choices they were making. I don't know. It just it didn't feel contrived to me. It just felt natural and warm. And nice. It was just a story about these people rather than a rom com and, and the way the therapist is included and these various laws as you go through the chapters make it. I just think I thought it stood out really. Thank you. That's so nice to hear. I really was trying to approach this from a very authentic angle. I don't know how I can go deeper into that. It's just I was trying to be very natural, very emotional, very feeling. And I hope that comes across in the book. And what's been the best moment for you so far in your writing career? If you could pinpoint one event, one moment so far, what would it be? I did an event, actually. Yeah, so it was the Ontario Library Association. They were doing a conference in January. It was right the day right before my birthday. And they, my publisher set me up to do some signings for of arts for the librarians and other people who were there. And It was my very first signing. It was so exciting, especially because my book hadn't even come out yet. But what's also really special about that is my family was there. My mom wasn't there because she was in Pakistan at the time, but my dad, my older brother, my older sister were there. And it was just such a special moment because of that, because they know that it was always my dream to be published, how hard I've been working, how big of a reader I have been ever since I was a kid. So it really felt nice that I got to have them there while I approached something that was the very first of my writing career, which was the signing. 
Wonderful. We come to a question about book recommendations, Alina. I'm just wondering if you could give us three books that you would recommend to us, what would they be? Okay, so these books feel like they're unrelated to also my book and each other, but I recommend anything by Anne Liang. She is such a great writer. Her most recent release was I Hope This Doesn't Find You. Uh, and it's about uh, two academic rivals who it's basically pitched as 12 The Boys of Love before, but if Lara Jean wrote hate emails instead of love letters. And it's like oh. mostly directed to her high school co captain. And it's just, it's so great. I love it so much. I always tell her, like, because I got to read an early version of it. And I read it on my plane ride to Pakistan. And I tell her she saved that flight because they (laughs) turned all the lights off at three o'clock. And I was like, I brought this huge book. It was Chain of Gold, I think, by Cassandra Clare. I was like, I brought this huge book to read on this flight. And now I can't because they turned all the lights off. But I just opened up my laptop and I had the file for I Hope This Doesn't Find You. So I just read that for seven hours straight till it was done. And it was just, she I was like, I tell you, you saved that flight. There's also As Long as the Lemon Trees Grow by Zofa Katua, the author I mentioned earlier, who lives in Switzerland. It's just such a, a great book about the Syrian revolution. And it really brings awareness to what's happening there. And it's such a love letter to the country. And you can really feel the emotion that Zofa is writing in that book as well. And then this one is very unrelated, but it's the Bear and the Nightingale series by Catherine Arden. I love those books. I read them for the first time in 2021. And it was just like, boom, 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 one after the other. I could not get enough. It's usually, it's not really something that I typically read. I don't read a lot of adult fantasy. And I certainly don't read a lot of adult fantasy without romance. But the little kernels of the romance were there, but it definitely wasn't the focus. But it was still such an enthralling series. I loved it so much. Wow, I'm horridly writing all these down as as we go. So yeah, that that's by Catherine Arden as well. I will include all these books in the show notes of this episode. If anyone wants to see all those three, I'm sure everyone will. The details will be in the show notes. But those are some super books. Thank you for those. Anything to hype up my favourite books and get people to read what I like to read. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. We come to the final question, which is the crucial one on this podcast. And it concerns the subject of biscuits or cookies. And it is what biscuit was powering the writing of Maya's Laws of Love. What is your preferred biscuit or cookie? Oh, my gosh. I feel like I'm so basic. I really... I don't like home cooked cookies, like homemade cookies, or even the stuff that you get from like the Pillsbury Doughboys. Like that's just (laughs) too cookie for me. I prefer like the fake stuff. I like, I don't know if they have this brand in the UK, but they're called Chips Ahoy. And they have definitely are not the same that as they used to be. They definitely used to be a lot better, but they are my preferred cookie of choice. Fantastic. And is those with bits of chocolate in? Do they have like chocolate chips? Yeah. Yeah. I like the chocolate chips one. Fabulous. So it's just wonderful to talk to you and hear more about Maya's Laws of Love. Alina Quadja, thank you so very much. Thank you so much for having me. This is so lovely. Coming up, more book reviews. So let's get stuck in to the Women's Prize long list. Why am I doing this? As I mentioned on a previous episode, I'd been listening to the audiobook about the history of the Silver Moon bookshop. And it really made me think it's called A Bookshop of One's Own. It's by Jane Chomley and it's narrated by Jane as well. So it's a brilliant audio book, but it also mentioned the establishment of the Women's Prize for Fiction. And it made me realise that I have, I've just, I haven't read the books. I haven't followed it. I thought it was just not for me. And it just, I don't know, it just sparked my curiosity this time. I thought, no, come on, Philippa. Let's just try and be a grown up for once. Let's read some of these books. And it's just consuming me. It really is. I've got another two on the go at the moment an audiobook and a book I'm reading. But let me tell you about the ones that I've read so far. The first one, Western Lane by Chetna Maru. This was the first one that I read. It's very short. I think it was about 120 pages. But it offered me some reassurance. I think it was a really good book to read first that actually. I could read these books and that I would enjoy them and that I was it was basically the right thing to do in terms of reading them. So it was a great starting point. And I gave it 10 out of 10. I loved it straight away. As I say, it's short. It's about a father and his three daughters. 
and they're dealing with the ramifications of the mother's death. And it all centres around them playing squash and the father trying to teach them to play squash. I thought it was beautiful. As I say, I just read it and I loved it. And when a book does that, I think it's wonderful. And whenever I see that book now, I went into a bookshop at the weekend. Can you believe it? Dangerous times, people, dangerous times. And I saw the one and I just thought, oh, there's Western Lane. I really like that book. That was the first one. Very good. The second one I read was called Restless Dolly Maunder by Kate Grenville. Uh, Kate's an Australian writer. And this is a story of Dolly's life in Australia. And it's she describes how they are the hinge generation, that they they weren't free to do whatever they want. You could argue our women still. Anyway, let's not let's not even go down there. But it was a, it's set in a time when there is considerable change. And these women really walk the steps for us to then walk in in the future and have more choice and more freedoms. And it really shone a light on women at that time. And it was the note from the author at the end that added so much to the story. And I thought, oh, this one would be a good one for book clubs because there's a lot to chew over and discuss. That was a memorable book. I gave it nine and a half out of ten. I found some of the subjects like the depression just hard from, you know, I work in investments and there's been enough, (laughs) there's been enough stuff to deal with over the last few years. So hearing more about the depression and the financial slump, just, I don't know, it just hit a nerve for me. So that's not the author's fault at all, that's mine. But it, it just, I felt, uneasy about that bit but I still thought it was a brilliant story and as I say it was the author's note at the end that really made me reflect on it all and it wouldn't that author's note meant it got a a nine and a half anyway next book Philippa come on the next one is called River East River West by Aubrey Lescure I hope I've pronounced that right apologies if I haven't what to say? I listened to this as an audiobook and I'm not sure if that was the right thing it's got two narrators so I thought great didn't love it. it. It was fine. I thought sometimes some of the content was a bit disturbing. It's a story about growing up. It's one of the narrators was giving the view from this man, this girl's stepfather, actually, and it showed how he'd grown up. And now call me crazy. I'm sure you will. But my thought was a women's prize for fiction. Yes, it's written by a woman, but also, I don't know why I thought this. I just thought the stories would be more about women. Maybe that's the wrong thing, actually. Now I'm vocalising that. That's probably the wrong thing. But I don't know. It just didn't sit right. So maybe it wasn't that it was the story of this man's life, but just how it went. And I don't know, just some of it made me feel uncomfortable. Some of the spicier scenes I didn't like but often that's hard particularly as an audiobook because you're literally having to listen to someone narrate it and you're sort of grinding your teeth thinking oh no thank you I, I mean I gave it seven and a half out of ten so I thought it was you know it wasn't awful but it's not it's not my favorite and then the final book that I've read so far on the short list the long list even is The Blue Beautiful World by Karen Lord now nah. I read this on the Kindle and it's sci-fi book. So I was fully in for this. I was like, yeah, I'm going to love this. I had no idea that a sci-fi book could be on the women's prize long list. Wonderful. And I started reading it. The writing was great. but I reread the beginning about three times. Now, I don't like sci-fi books that have loads of world building where you feel you've had to study for an exam in this book before you get onto the character development. Uh, you know, too much world building, no thank you. But this, this was the opposite. There was, there was no world building. And I just felt, I started thinking, because th- there is a series by this author, and I thought, did, did somebody in the office send the wrong book for submission to the long list? Is that what happened? I just didn't understand. I, I felt, I didn't feel like I was tethered to each character because I didn't know what was going on. And so I I want to read more of the author's books. And I think the author is a thumbs up. 
But this particular book just didn't feel like the right entry point. I think I'd go back and read like the first in the series. So yes to the author, but no to this book. So I'm afraid I'd only give it probably a five out of ten. Because, yeah, it just, it didn't float my boat. Sad times, but there, there we go. But I'm, as I say, I'm reading, listening to another couple and I've got all the rest on order from the library or audiobooks or Kindles, all sorts of things to get that covered because I just think it'd be really exciting to have read all 16. I mean, if I could choose, can I read all 16 before the shortlist is announced? I don't know if that's possible. I might have to do a whole episode at the end after the shortlist and maybe with the winner going on about each book. I don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing. All I know is I'm loving it. And so if you are interested in the Women's Prize, or even if not, the two books so far I would really recommend. Number one has to be Western Lane by Chetna Maru and the other one Restless Donnie Maunder by Kate Grenville, both of which I got from the library. But if you've only got time to read one and it's a short one, Western Lane so far is the winner for me. But those are your books. I've talked enough. I need to send you on your way. So let me just have a quick recap. We've had Maya's Laws of Love by Alina Kwaja. And I've also talked to you about Western Lane by Chetna Maru, Restless Dolly Maunder by Kate Grenville, River East, River West by Aubrey Lescure, and The Blue Beautiful World by Karen Lord. Now, the book recommendations that Alina kindly gave us, those, as I mentioned earlier, will be in the show notes. And uh, just to repeat, they are I Hope This Doesn't Find You by Anne Liang, As Long As The Lemon Trees Grow by Zulfa Katu, and The Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden. I am really intrigued by those. I'm going to go off and do a bit of research. So that's it. I'm leaving you today. I hope you're OK. I hope you're doing all right. We're into spring. We're into Easter. Easter eggs. I hope you've had um, some Easter eggs, if that's your thing. And if not, just go and obtain some chocolate. And I just hope you're taking care of yourself because other people might not take care of us, but we can take care of ourselves. And I'm sending you big hugs. Just look after yourselves and I'll talk to you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.